Every week, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people board buses in Nicaraguan cities with one goal in mind, to head for the United States of America. Ahead of them lies a dangerous and challenging journey of almost 3,000 kilometers, that's 1,864 miles, that could cost them more than $2,000 per person. Visual economic viewers, Nicaragua is the second poorest country in the Americas. It is surpassed only by Haiti, a country we recently told you about on our sister channel, Visual Politic. However, for decades, and despite only having a per capita income of less than $2,000, immigration has never been a problem. Unlike in many of its neighbors in Nicaragua, it was not so common to pack up and just leave the country. Now, however, everything has changed. Rising inflation, falling wages, the blow to democracy perpetuated by Daniel Ortega, and above all else, the lack of confidence in the country's future have set everything into a tailspin. For the first time in history, Nicaragua has become one of the main sources of immigrants at the southern border of the United States. To give you an idea what we are talking about, more than 180,000 Nicaraguans crossed the southern border of the United States in 2022 alone. And obviously, if we take into account that Nicaragua itself has fewer than 7 million inhabitants, that figure is immense. And that's not all. Many thousands more await their turn in Mexico. And here, we have to make a side note. In the United States, Nicaraguan immigrants have an advantage over other immigrants from other countries. Why? Because they are largely exempt from the application of Title 42. Their country does not allow deportation flights, and Mexico has refused to accept immigrants from this country. But the United States is not even the only destination. Since 2018, more than 150,000 Nicaraguans have applied for asylum in Costa Rica and thousands more in other countries. The result is that, in total, over the last four years, 10% of the entire population of Nicaragua has left the country. But take note, because although that is already outrageous, it is nothing compared to the rate of departures in the last year. At the 2022 rate, in just a decade, Nicaragua would lose practically half of its entire entire population. 4.9% of Nicaragua's population left the country in 2022. We are talking about an unprecedented exodus. An exodus which, by the way, is having certain benefits for the government itself. Almost 20% of fiscal income already depends on remittances. And considering the speed with which Nicaraguans are leaving, this percentage will only continue to rise in the coming years. Be that as it may, the fact is that Nicaraguans are leaving simply because they can't take it anymore. The country is very poor, and it is clear to practically everyone that that is not going to change. And keep in mind that this is the reality despite the enormous international aid that Nicaragua has received in recent years. Between 2008 and 2017 alone, we are talking about almost $10 billion, the equivalent of 75% of the GDP in just nine years. And that is only taking into account the aid from multilateral institutions and Chavista Venezuela. In other words, by itself, international aid became one of the most important important economic sectors in the country. However, as you can see, it does not seem to have been very effective. Today, Nicaraguans are fleeing the country as they never have before. But this is visual economic. So the question we would like to answer is, how on earth can Nicaragua escape from poverty? What is the best way to go about it? Visual economic viewers, we are going to show you political and economic options that have not worked and others that have allowed the reduction of the number of poor families in the country. In other words, we are going to see what works and what does not work with a few examples of different possibilities that have already been tried in Nicaragua. Nicaragua. So, let's get cracking. The Revolution. Since its creation in 1838, Nicaragua has endured all kinds of conflicts, struggles and wars between clans, great families, ideologies, and satraps and criminals of all kinds. Perhaps that explains why this is the second poorest country in the Americas, as I've already said. To give you an idea, productivity growth since 1950 has been close to zero. All in all, it has had a lot of ups and downs. After the Second World War, for example, and despite being under the control of the Somoza family dictatorship, the country experienced a certain improvement for a time. Between 1950 and 1977, according to ECLAC data, the country's economy grew at an annual rate of 6%. It was not an impressive figure, but it wasn't bad. This was achieved thanks to agricultural exports, the mechanization of the fields, and, above all, the development of the cotton sector. For example, the development of the textile industry more than doubled the proportion of its industrial sector. It went from 10.1% of GDP in 1950 to 21.8% in 1977. In other words, if we had visited Nicaragua at that time, we would have seen a country that, despite being subjected to a fierce dictatorship seemed to be slowly beginning to take shape. Industry and commerce were growing, more and more offices were gradually being built in the big cities, and the countryside was becoming increasingly mechanized. However, hold on a moment, because four phenomena occurred that would completely paralyze this process. <laughs> 
First, the breakup of the Central African cotton market after the exit of Honduras in 1970. It was a hard blow to a commercial and productive structure that was just beginning to take off in a coordinated manner in the various countries that were part of this project. Second, the crisis of 1973, which caused the price of oil to skyrocket. This increased the cost of imports and also made agriculture, which was highly dependent on the intensive use of insecticides, fertilizers, and chemicals, less competitive. Third, the 1972 earthquake which destroyed Managua, which was not only the country's capital, but also its main commercial and financial center. To put this in perspective, it is estimated that the economic impact of this earthquake was equivalent to 30% of the entire national GDP. And fourth, and finally, the dictatorship itself. You see, visual economic viewers, the Somozas did not hesitate to expropriate properties and evict hundreds of peasant families in order to boost their businesses. They fed a terribly corrupt state and ended up indebting it up to the neck. In the end, the enormous social discontent towards the Somozas and the country's increasing foreign debt caused capital to start flying and business investment, both foreign and domestic, to come to a standstill. There was just too much uncertainty. In fact, all of these factors ended up triggering a civil war that ended the Somoza dictatorship and, not surprisingly, caused significant economic damage. According to World Bank data, the damage exceeded $2 billion, which was the equivalent to almost 100% of the country's GDP at the time. Be that as it may, in 1979, a revolutionary Sandinista government came to power, promising to carry out an economic and social revolution to put an end to the country's main problems – poverty, inequality, lack of development, etc. So the question is, how do you think they did it? Well, I'm sure many of you can already imagine. The revolutionaries decided to nationalize the banking system, natural resources, many enterprises, and more than 800,000 hectares of agricultural land. State-owned corporations were also created to manage agricultural trade and control many factories. Not surprisingly, they also established huge controls on trade. All in name of a revolution that was supposed to be able to tackle poverty and reduce inequality. These measures are very similar to those that many politicians argue for today in Latin American countries or even more in developed countries. For example, I am sure you will find good examples of this in Spain. Well, the question I'm wondering is, how on earth did this plan work out? Well, the truth is, not great. It was a complete failure. The public enterprises were terribly incompetent and ruinous. To give you an idea, their annual losses averaged 11% of the country's entire GDP. Then, the public centralization of the management of the agricultural sector sank the farmers' income. And to top it all off, the use of the new public bank for political purposes caused delinquency to skyrocket, which along with the interest rates limited by law meant that it had to be rescued by the central bank and its powerful banknote printing machine. A machine that was also used to cover the government's huge budget gaps. We are talking about deficit levels that exceeded 25% of GDP. So what was the result of this central bank intervention? Well, hold on to your seat, because between 1988 and 1989, there was hyperinflation of 43,000%, one of the most extreme in history. And they didn't achieve peace either. The government's policies provoked a huge insurrection, supported by the United States, although this topic is something more typical of visual politic. The fact is that, by 1990, when the revolution came to an end, not only had poverty not been reduced, but GDP per capita was back to the level it had been in the 1940s. And not only that, the government had also accumulated a huge foreign debt of almost $10 billion at the time, the equivalent to 300% of the national GDP. So whichever way you look at it, it was a huge disaster. No, the revolution and the substitution of market capitalism did not succeed in tackling poverty. So let's move on to another of the great remedies that are always put forth. Natural Resources How many times have we been convinced that a natural resource by itself is capable of changing the fate of a country? And it doesn't matter if we're talking about lithium, oil, copper, or gas. It is often taken for granted that this will be the surefire solution for success. Well, I'm sorry, but as a general rule, this is not the case. It is something we have already told you about here on Visual Economic before. And do you know what? In a way, Nicaragua is a good example. Surprising as it may seem, this country became a major exporter of gold. In fact, during the 1930s and 1940s, gold accounted for more than 60% of all exports from Nicaragua. In 1953, for example, this country produced produced 1% of all the gold produced worldwide, a production valued at billions of dollars, which, nevertheless, did not turn the country's fortunes around. Why? Well, corruption and the misuse of public revenues ultimately meant that this exploitation did not serve to boost the national economy. In fact, one difference between Nicaragua and the United States, for example, is that in the Central American country, the benefits go to the state and not to the landowners. In fact, the landowners usually lose the land they are expropriated. This is quite common in these countries. And then to top it off, the governments waste the money that is generated or negotiate lousy deals. 
So politicians and governments that rely on the exploitation of natural resources, well, they rarely succeed in making that effective in reducing poverty and encouraging economic growth. Can you recall, for instance, any politician who has called for the nationalization of natural resources as the magic solution to all problems? Well, there you go. In order for natural resources to serve development, more is needed. Institutional security, reasonable taxes, and a lot more transparency, among other factors. And of course, since none of that existed in Nicaragua, mining development here, unlike countries like Australia, did nothing to reduce poverty and develop the national economy. So it doesn't matter if a country has lithium, gold, gas, or any other raw material if it doesn't have the ingredients, it is very likely that those resources will not help to reduce poverty. But having said that, we have yet to see the third magic potion that the most populous politicians attempt to resort to again and again. Let's see what it is. Super Projects If revolution doesn't work and natural resources alone are not enough either, why not try with big super projects? Well, as we say in the visual family, no sooner said than done. In 2013, President Daniel Ortega rescued an old project from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the construction of a new canal known as the Interoceanic Canal or Nicaraguan Canal, a canal of colossal dimensions, much larger than the Panama Canal. Here, you can see some comparative data. The Nicaragua Canal would be deeper, longer, and would allow the transit of much larger ships than the Panama Canal. It would allow, for example, the passage of all existing or planned container ships. The idea, as I said, was not new. At the end of the 19th century, the United States was studying it and even started some works in 1890, although they were suspended soon after. In the 1920s, the subject came up again, but the crisis of 1929 destroyed any possibility. Be that as it may, the fact is that in the same year, 2013, a 100-year concession was signed with a Chinese company registered in Hong Kong. Law 840, recognizing this concession, granted the Chinese company many benefits, including the possibility of expropriating the land of more than 50,000 peasants. So you may be wondering, what was the problem with this project? Project. Well, it was very expensive. So expensive that it could hardly be viable. To give you an idea, it is estimated that the works could easily cost more than $40 billion without taking into account cost overruns and unforeseen events, let alone the risk of this infrastructure crossing areas with highly volcanic and seismic activity or the environmental damage that the project could cause. In the end, the figure could be much, much higher. So what is the problem? You may be thinking that entrusting the economic success of a country to macro projects like this one entails many drawbacks. For example, this canal would have to compete not only with the Panama Canal, which, by the way, could respond with a price war, but also with so-called dry canals. That is, infrastructure that allows cargo to be unloaded quickly at a port on one ocean, transported by rail, and reloaded at the port on the other ocean. These types of projects are materializing in countries such as Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Panama itself. In fact, the dry canal concept was spearheaded by Nicaragua in the 1990s, and this country later took up the same idea at the turn of the century. However, the project to build a large canal in the style of the Panama Canal caused this dry canal possibility to be discarded. In the end, the Great Canal never became a reality, so they had neither one thing nor the other. This is one of the risks involved in these macro projects, that people stop paying attention to projects that could have been much more productive. Then, we would also have to see what costs and what risks the country would bear and the overdependence that these works could provoke, not to mention the impact of corruption. I mean, don't get us wrong, it can be a good idea to carry out large projects if they can really be profitable. The problem is that it is rarely possible to move in a country from poverty to wealth in this way. And to make matters worse, these projects are often profitable only for the promoters or the politicians in charge. Nicaragua was precisely one of these cases. So beware big promises. So then, what can be done to reduce poverty? Is there a case in Nicaragua itself that can serve as an example? Well, the truth is yes. And do you know what? The most effective and successful policies are usually the much more boring ones. Boring ideas, but effective. In 2012, the Ministry of Family, Economy and the National Institute of Technology launched a program to encourage many poor people to start their own businesses. To achieve this, they explained to them the steps to follow, the essential issues to watch out for in the day-to-day -day running of the business, such as locating potential customers, finding financing and basic notions of accounting. In other words, they made setting up a small business much easier for poor people with little or no training. And keep in mind, we are not talking about a big change or a huge gamble, but a small program with low cost. And guess what? No, it was not a revolution, but it does have very positive effects. According to research, this program increased the number of people who decided to start a business and, as an example, led to an increase of almost 20% in the income of the youngest and least educated female workers who participated in the program. And what can I say? It makes perfect sense. In the end, the best way to reduce poverty is to help the poorest, most disadvantaged and less educated people to start a small business and thus be able to exploit their capabilities. 
fact, another of the things that is needed in such underdeveloped economies is to encourage the extension of the banking business and to ensure that credit for productive activities can flow to people with fewer resources. As this is a seldom explored area, the returns in terms of poverty reduction could be very large. I mean, for example, for a farmer, the difference between having access to a tractor and similar machines can be enormous and can determine whether or not he or she escapes from poverty. In fact, the relative good performance that Nicaragua's economy had between the years 2011 and 2017 has a lot to do with the increased access to financing for everyone. In contrast, when political and social uncertainty caused credit to plummet in 2018, the economy slowed to a crawl. I mean, think about it. In a country where everything has yet to be done and there is hardly any capital, credit and economic growth go hand in hand. Therefore, it may be essential to promote measures that facilitate financing for the small self-employed business owners and entrepreneurs. And let's see, it's not about encouraging huge leverage, but when you are poor and you have nothing, being able to access a little credit, well, it can boost your productivity. And that's exactly what it might take to escape from poverty. Another example is the free trade zones, areas where export-oriented companies have an easier time doing business. Things like fewer administrative obstacles, no tariffs, fewer taxes, etc, etc, etc. Nicaragua is very poor, but perhaps what works best in the country are these economic zones. In 2018, for example, there were 225 companies installed in them, employing about 120,000 people. These are just three examples, but naturally, a free trade zone or a business training or microfinance scheme, well, it doesn't sound as impressive or sell as well as a revolution or building a $40 billion plus mega canal. However, if we are talking about reducing poverty, the more boring policies tend to work better. So from Visual Economic, we send you one message. Government people do more boring things. But having said that, it's now over to you. What do you think of these failed solutions and these other more successful ones? Can you think of any other alternative policies for combating and reducing poverty? As always, you can leave us your answers in the comments below and let's open a respectful debate. If you found this video interesting, don't forget to like all of us here and subscribe to the channel at Visual Economic if you haven't already done so. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.